Hi, I'm Rhys Morgan, and welcome to the Social Good Podcast. News and inspiration from and for startup, social enterprise, and charity founders. We help you make a difference. In this interview, I chat with Lucy Findlay from Social Enterprise Mark. Social Enterprise Mark is the only internationally available social enterprise accreditation scheme, enabling organisations to prove they're in business primarily to create benefits for people and planet. I and all the people I've interviewed would appreciate it if you could rate and review the show on the platform of your choice. Apparently iTunes is the most influential and to make it really easy, if you go to socialgoodpodcast.com, we have a link on all the episodes that lets you submit your review, and each review lets past and future interviewees spread their message. Follow us on all the usual social media platforms. Details are on the website. As usual, I asked Lucy to tell me her story. All oh, right. Well, thank you very much, Rhys. Um, I started out uh, in the social enterprise world, sort of stumbling over it, really, I think. Um, I had trained to be a town planner um, at Oxford Brookes University, and I was doing a bit of research after my uh, degree. And I went to um, a place called Asta Levera in South Wales, and uh, I was actually researching community-based regeneration projects and I was looking at how local communities could really take control of their own destiny and I was fascinated to see this lady called Judith who had set up what I then found out was um, a development trust. So what she'd done is she'd used the regeneration funds from her um, local authority and from the government to invest in uh, office space, um, obviously in partnership with the local community, uh, to generate um, both office space and uh, commercial space to create an income for the community in the longer term. And this was in a quite a deprived community, Asta Levera in uh, South Wales. When would this have been? Post the miners' strike? Uh, yeah, it was post miners' strike because that's why there was a lot of regeneration cash going into those communities. So I guess it was probably it was probably pre it probably predated the Coalfields Regeneration Trust, um, but it was around the uh, sort of mid nineties, I think. Um, and I was just really inspired by that model of regeneration 
So, you know, quite often what you'd see was a local community or a local authority would take the money and then would spend it. And then at the end of the regeneration scheme, there wasn't anything left. Um, and that community kind of was back to square one, particularly if they had invested in, um, you know, sort of local community groups that obviously weren't bringing and uh, sustaining an income. Uh, so the the model of asset based regeneration, i.e., investing um, money into assets to yield an income, would allow for the cross subsidy of those sorts of types of activity. Um, so from that, I um, I discovered the Development Trusts Association, and I worked for them for quite a long time, both in London and the uh, and the South East. Uh, working on those types of schemes and I was advising uh, some of the um, regeneration schemes that the regional development agencies were involved in uh, about how they could become more sustainable and, and take that sort of model of uh, investing and creating a trust that would be there um, kind of ad infinitum for that that local community to carry on that work and to work as a as a body to uh, if other if other monies came along you know they could could use that body to to invest in the local community so um, I worked for them for quite a while and um, around that sort of time the term social enterprise became coined um uh it was um uh, a uh, quite an exciting time the new labor government was just coming in as it was then um late 90s and um there was excitement around the model of of social enterprise and what it could do in particular there was um the cooperative movement that were looking at things like um leisure centers so gll was a good example of where local communities have actually actually taken control of um, their particular leisure facilities and used it and um, you know generated a, a, an income and a, a different model of doing business. So um, I, I got involved in probably in the very early days of social enterprise um, through my job at the Development Trust Association. Um, and um, at that time, the local, uh, the re, uh, the uh, regional development agencies were looking for um, looking to support social enterprise, and the um, all of the regional development agencies were investing in some kind of social enterprise regional body. Um, and my husband was being relocated down to the southwest i was based in the southeast so he was relocated down to the southwest and um uh, the opportunity to apply for the job of the chief executive of the first uh, the first chief executive of the regeneration body uh, for social enterprise came up um, and i applied for it and i got it uh, for my sins um, so uh, and in those days it was uh, I look back on it it was it was um, um, positively amazing environment really for social enterprise a lot of money was being invested in infrastructure and support for social enterprises um, and that was the whole idea of, of, um, of as, uh, as was that it would help um, to create a, a regional identity and a regional infrastructure for social enterprises. But we were acutely aware that, um, you know, that sort of amazing situation probably wouldn't last. Um, we've seen um, uh, governments come and go and um, invest in their own ideas or not invest at all. Uh, so we felt that we needed to practice what we preached. Um, and I could see that um, in, in conversation with, with some of our members in the Southwest, that there was a particular gap around this issue about how you articulated yourself as a social enterprise, um, which was why we applied to the lottery 
to test out this idea of what became the social enterprise mark. Um, so uh, we set up a project which tested the, um, the thoughts of that um, and developed the criteria for the social enterprise mark um, with expertise and consultation with the sector, always envisaging that this would something potent be potentially you know, nationally significant. Uh, so we then tested that, um, developed it and launched it in um, 2008. Um, oh no, I think it was 2007 actually, November 2007. Um, so actually we, we are quite old as a project. Um, but we launched, we, we, we uh, gathered enough sort of momentum to then decide, well, actually, we need to do this at a, at a national level. Um, and we just kind of went for it. Um, we got into partnership with various organisations and uh, we launched the Social Enterprise Mark um, CIC in February of 2010. Um, and th that's kind of the history really of of where where i am and why we are where we are um the social enterprise market itself has um, gone through quite a few iterations since then um we have been um developing the product when we first started out um it was very much about well this is your legal structure you are or you aren't a social enterprise or you know how much you trading but since then we've done quite a lot of work on the social impact side of things so we uh, every year we uh, support our mark holders to better articulate what their social impact is it's often easier for some of the bigger ones but for some of the smaller social enterprises it's uh, probably a question of demystifying that process but as part of the ongoing assessment we actually help organizations to do that which can be really useful for them because they're able then to use that in their literature and also um, you know to funders and to um, other potential investors um, we don't um, uh, we don't necessarily formally endorse that impact statement but we are helping them to articulate that um, because we've got no means of kind of checking all of that information but it's about helping them to articulate it um, and all of that sits on our directory so we're the only um, accreditation scheme that does that kind of work so if you go onto our directory not only will you find out about that organization you'll also find out about the the impact that they are making which i think is a, a useful thing um, we also felt that there was an opportunity to look at how social enterprise um, demonstrates excellence so we developed something called uh, the social enterprise gold mark which has now been going for three years um, and that has been particularly popular with the health sector and with um, the university sector. Um, and it's been interesting, actually, that it's really caught on with the university sector because they are um, very keen to be able to show how much social good they're actually doing um, because, you know, there's obviously so much bad press um, around about VCs, salaries, uh, and about um, how students are paying so much money and what are they getting in return and it's about articulating that actually there is a social value for money that a university education provides as well as a um, you know a, a calculation that the government might try and impose about how uh, um, a, a student gets a you know a brilliant job at the end of um, at the end of their um, at the end of their degree so uh, we've been doing work on that and um, just recently we have also been working with DWP to develop a specialist mark around supported businesses um, and this is a very new development um, which is still in gestation really and we're just developing some testing around that to support businesses that 
have um, primarily got um, disabled people in their workforce. So um, we've developed a, you know, a, a set of products from going from like a one, um, a one, one sort of That's stop right. shop for social enterprise to you know, moving into the excellence field and then moving in to specialisms uh, uh, as well. Wow, right. Um, what next? So what, how, ma how many staff have you got? Is it just you and, and Helen helping you or? No, um, there's, there's five of us in total. So we have somebody who works um, on the assessment side, Richard. Uh, we have Sophie who works on the marketing. Uh, Rachel, who works on um, the, um, the business development side and, and supporting our, our renewals. Um, and then Katrina, who works part time on, um, on the finance side of things, and then myself. So that's the five of us. Uh, we so, kept quite busy. <laughs> exactly, uh, and managing that team. What, uh, as we speak, you're days away from your national conference, um, and I know you're you're waiting for a really important phone call, and uh, we, we'll cut to that if it. Well, we won't we won't broadcast it. Uh, in fact, I won't even listen to it. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I'm diff I don't know how to phrase this question. Um, so I, I, I can't really talk about the conference because it hasn't happened yet. Um, yeah. what, you've had them before? Yes, yes. Um, each year has been a, a different theme. Um, last year we were in uh, Winchester and we were talking about the wider um, agenda about you know, where social enterprise was going. And it was a very interesting time because the, um, the election had just happened. Um, and we had a speaker who was um, who was uh, from uh, a political background, and there we were all expecting a you know sort of um, a, a unanimous vi uh, victory for the Conservative Party, and we were completely thrown. So um, uh, we did talk a little bit about Brexit, and we couldn't quite work out where things were going. And I don't think we were him any. Um, any clearer on that for social enterprise. Uh, th this year we're talking about spreading the wealth. Um, so it's about the fact that the world's wealth is held by a very small proportion of people. Um, and increasingly what we're seeing is a polarisation um, within um, the world. Um, certainly um, we see that in the UK as well. Um, and that, you know, is there a way to try and address that through social enterprise? Um, so we've got an interesting speaker who's uh, previously worked for Oxfam on the report about um, that particular issue, but he's also now working for Fair Trade. Um, and he has a crit critical analysis of really what the agendas are for big business um, because they will. Uh, talk a good talk about how they cascade the wealth down and support local communities but at the end of the day is that a reality and um, you know does the shareholder um, uh, drive actually lead to a situation where you know profit always has to come before the social and environmental aspect which you know, businesses will argue, well, actually, it makes good business sense um, to combine environmental and social missions into it. But at the end of the day, there is an overriding agenda there, which um, he will argue it tends to lead to um, a certain outcomes, which doesn't necessarily lead to the best um solutions for local communities particularly in the developing world but i think there's a read across um with all of that and, and what's happened what we've seen happen um in in this country and you know where we see some of the big comp um companies that have taken over delivery of public services for example 
where um, actually the 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 actual um, the the motivations behind that and the the um, I don't know how to articulate this, but the the thoughts of why that done more ideological and is it actually a better way of delivering? And we're seeing, you know, certainly some of those big um, companies that were set up to deliver public services now um, in difficulties, really, um, because obviously they have to make a profit out of what they're doing. Um, and that's the bottom line for why they're there. What I remember, it's a few couple of months ago now, I suppose, even longer, Carillion collapsed and yeah. um, lots of people were going, oh, why don't we try social enterprise in future? Your take on it then would be? Um, do you, do you well, think social enterprise, I mean, social enterprise can't be the whole answer or, or am no, I? No, I, I don't think that social enterprise is the entire answer, although some, some people would say, you know, um, maybe we should be, um, we should be looking at that, um, that as a, as a solution. I don't, I don't, I don't see, I'm not a complete I, idealist, I suppose, in that. I'm more of a pragmatist. But I think we need to learn, and what I, what what really I think um, kind of cheeses me off a bit is the fact that we're often told to look towards big business for solutions, and actually the solutions um, it might not be in that legal structure, or whatever. But the solutions that social enterprise has about how they work with local people and the social and the drive the social impact being at the forefront of what they do is a lesson and we shouldn't keep harping back to you know saying oh you know um corporate is provides all of the answers and i've written a blog about this um, when Caribbean collapsed um it's about taking the lessons of social enterprise and saying well actually these are the businesses that we need to be looking to and this type of business in order to create a fairer world. Um, and it might be applying some of those principles to business, but actually shareholder value didn't used to be the main and only um, way in which uh, a business was judged. And I was listening to a very interesting um, um, broadcast from Radio 4 the other day about how um, Harvard Business School um, has sort of developed this um, model which now all business schools are, are um, teaching which is a very narrow view of business and I mean if we look back at um, historically how local communities um, existed you had all sorts of um, um, family-owned businesses, cooperatives, a whole rich view of what business was about. And it was like providing a business solution to a social problem. Um, but instead, we seem to have got stuck on this idea that we need to be growing um, and we need to get bigger and bigger and bigger equals more efficiency and therefore you need to float on the stock exchange, you know. So I think it's about being uh, looking back to sort of maybe some solutions of the past and saying, well, you know, why have we become so sort of almost straight jacketed in our view of business? It, it's also, isn't it, looking at the German, uh, Met, what do they call them, Metgattelsch gifts? Yes. The sort of um, German family owned business. Yes. That, um, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, uh, we used to have that, but, um, and in fact, I talked to a number of, of family owned businesses as part of my own sort of personal development, but, and they have their own problems, you know, but it, it, it provides a whole sort of rich um, view. And um, I'll never forget um, talking about shareholding to, um, 
it's actually Martin Thatcher from Thatcher Cider. I don't know if you know Thatcher Cider. It's it's become one of the top ciders in in the UK. And he was saying to me, because um, I was thinking, uh, you know, do I need to get some more shareholders in because we're a shareholder owned CIC, although obviously we're limited with, um, you know, what profits we can distribute. And he said. Um, Lucy beware of selling the family silver you know and that's that's what it is isn't it you know you're you're selling your body and soul of the business to another organization who or individual who may or may not have the best interests of that business at heart so um it's 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 being sort of maybe a bit more canny about that and just thinking well, actually, what does that mean, and what will the what will that change in ownership um, lead to in the longer term? And I know there are, you know, social investors out there that are out to provide um, social impact, um, but at the end of the day, they've still got to make make money. Um, so, you know, what what pressures will that bring on your business, and what behaviours will that lead to? And they're always being compared to other people who lend money. So there are going to be pressures on them to maximise uh, their returns. Uh, exactly. And all, and all sorts yeah. of other things. Any other speakers yeah. you're looking forward particularly to hearing at the conference? Uh, yeah, um, we, well, we've got the CIC regulator who's um, coming. Um, so that's, that's really good news. We've got... Um, a speaker from the um, uh, um, Living Wage Foundation. Um, and I'm really pleased about that because I think there's a lot of read across um, with how they've been able to impact into getting um, employers to pay uh, a living wage. That's the Living Wage Foundation's living wage, not the government's living wage. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to that discussion. We've got um, a number of our mark holders speaking as well and some workshops. Um, on, the, uh, on the Wednesday before, we've um, also got um, one of our international mark holders speaking, Louise uh, Van Rin from um, Partners for Possibility in South Africa. So um, because we're international, uh, we um, want to give more flavour of, of some of the work that's going on outside of um, outside of the UK. Um, and Louise is going to be talking about their work, which is working um, in partnership with schools because schools face their own crisis within South Africa and how businesses have actually been helping those schools um, to address those issues with um, working in partnership with the head teachers so I'm looking for really looking forward to hearing about that how can um, our listener follow up so they've heard you can you uh, or particularly about that conference will all the details be on the website will there be recordings or uh, we're not we're not recording um, not recording it at um, we don't we haven't got the facilities we've done that before although I think probably actually sitting and listening to um, long talks on on YouTube aren't necessarily everyone's cup of tea. Um, but we will have um, a report on it on our um, on our website and on our, on our newsletter. So, um, you know, you will be able to see that. And then, you know, we will have all of the slides as well, which if people want to get in contact with us after the conference, we can certainly send those to them. Great. And after the conference, presumably you'll have a, a, a lie down in a dark room or go on holiday or something. Um, and when you come back, what are the plans for the rest of 2018 and beyond? Um, all right. OK. Um, well, I think the, the, the main um, thing for us is the development of this new disability employment mark, um, which we're hoping to launch. Uh, in the autumn, um, provided that um, we managed to get ministerial um, support for doing that. Um, they are quite supportive of us at the minute. It's just a question of when it gets launched. And that all needs to happen 
really before April of next year when the contracts for those businesses change. So that's the drive to get that um, underway. We're also looking to um, increase our international presence. Um, so we're now in 11 countries um, and we want to start to build stronger relationships with one or two of those countries in order to be able to um, either develop um, a, a, a bespoke mark or to work in partnership with um, people that want to gain our accreditation. Um, and the other thing is that we have just done a review of our gold mark and we're looking at whether we develop other tiers of accreditation between um, the social enterprise mark and the social enterprise gold mark so that it's more of a progression because the social enterprise gold mark isn't just a static product it's a it's an ongoing um, improvement tool um, which focuses on particular areas um, and develops an action plan for three years and I think there's some learning there that we can apply um, sort of between the social enterprise mark and the social enterprise gold mark so there's quite a lot of irons in the fire, but uh, we have to keep focused and because we're a small team, uh, keep focused on what we can realistically do. Um, so at the moment, our primary focus is to get the social enterprise uh, disability employment mark ready for market. Excellent. Uh, all the links will be in the show notes and on the website, socialgoodpodcast.com. Fun questions coming up now. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> Our beverage of choice, tea, coffee, or something different? Oh, tea, coffee, or uh, well, tea, coffee, or gin, I think. <laughs> tea, coffee, or gin. Maybe. Happy on the time, time of day. <laughs> cool. Um, Gary Vaynerchuk, yay or nay, or never heard of? Never heard of. Who is he? Of? I'll send you the link. Oh, okay. Um, scone or scone? Oh, depends who I'm talking to. Probably scone. That's what I was brought up with anyway. Cool. And a jam cream, which goes on top? Oh dear, I'm going to get into trouble if I say the wrong way round because my husband's Cornish. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> so no, I do actually agree with him that the jam should go on first because you can get more cream on. Yeah. Uh, that's and uh, what he does is he slices the scone in three, three uh, across three ways, horizontally. So you get three, three separate um, bits rather than two bits, and you can fit more, even more jam and cream on that way. You heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> you heard it here first. I'm going to YouTube that. Uh, straight after we've finished uh, I can't you quite need visualize to. it or, or I'm going to listen to that bit again and, yeah uh, you need to uh, you need to get a tall enough scone to be able to do it though so that means lots lots of yeast does it I don't think it don't think scones have yeast in them no it's self-raising no. flour self-raising yes okay yeah I think I might whenever I made scones they were never that good so um but when I see them in the in the bakery, they they generally seem they seem to get larger and larger. So um, yes. yeah, okay. Now we know. Wow, how cool! The things you learn on this podcast, brilliant. <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining me. Um, no, it's a pleasure, Rhys. And we look forward to the rest of two thousand and eighteen and nineteen and your plans. Thank you. Right, end of official. Is there anything else? you want me to ask uh i don't think so no um when 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 do you think it'll be going out in about a month three weeks okay. time three to four weeks right. time. right okay um i shall let sophie know that and i shall get her to send over the um the links and the um, and the picture brilliant there wasn't anything um, that was in the Tony interview that you thought I should be talking about? Um, no, no. Um, 
No, I'm I'm glad you mentioned because we're you know our listenership is really um, yeah is really British. You know, you yeah. you just said Welsh in the Tony Lloyd one. I I was wondering, oh, is that in the Ronda or is it more um, yeah. Swansea way? So Aslavera is Swansea way. So there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that answers that one without need. You know, I know where it is, but then I'm Welsh, and but at least those who are interested can google a slavera are are they still going (laughs) well are they still going and i'll put a link in the show notes i think i think they are actually um i don't know i haven't googled recently they were when i last looked what's Um, the name of the lady and is she still involved i don't think she will still be involved because that was years ago Um, okay Ask, yeah, I think it was called Asta Lavera Development Trust. Trust. I know that when I talked to um, some of the guys down in, um, I was at a conference, I think it was the CIC 10 year thing, and that was in Cardiff. I, I announced that that's where I'd um, learned about social enterprise, and everyone went, Oh, yeah, Judith, and yeah, Asta Lavera, yeah, yeah, we know about that. So um, it is still known about. So um, but yeah, have a look. Okay, I'll let Google do its magic. Um, yeah. The other thing I was half thinking of uh, during the time you were talking, I hardly ever interview men for this show. Right. And when I'm looking for guests, it's always women who come forward and go, da 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 Is it really heavily? And I went, I'm an SSE fellow. When I was on School of Social Enterprise and on the Unlimited scheme that gave me my first Do It Award, I was in the minority and a clear, clear minority. Yeah. Is, is that reflected in your membership? Um. I think it would depend. In the smaller social enterprises, it's often women um, right. and startups. Uh, it's an interesting. It's an interesting topic, and I was reading about it. Uh, reading about it this morning, actually, something came up on Facebook. Something called Beetroot, I think it was called, um, and it was an article about you know, are women are there more women, women social entrepreneurs? And it was more articulating why women it's an unfavorable environment for women to set up mainstream businesses because um, there's more likelihood of um, men getting investment, et cetera, et cetera. But what it did say was that a lot of women see community, they tend to be more community focused um, and see a problem and want to solve it and use and are looking at a more of a social enterprise model. Um, and women tend to be, less um maybe less um confident in their ability in terms of uh um you know mainstream business as well because it's quite a male dominated environment and i was saying you know about talking to martin thatcher but i'm part of something called the academy for chief executives um and that's mainstream business predominantly um some family businesses and some bigger and they are very male dominated. So I think it's more about the style of business. But as you get bigger, um, you tend to see more men coming in. So a social enterprise might be started by a woman, but then, you know, once it gets to a certain size, then the women, then the men come in and the women duck out. So uh, we need more women running big social enterprises, I think. So maybe it's, Maybe it's the fact that, you know, obviously SSE is aimed at the startup market. Um, but if you were to interview some of the big social entrepreneurs, um, you know, the, the, that they tend to be more men. Um, so you might, if you look at some of the, the big ones, then you will get a different um, perspective. So, ladies, please stick with it as you grow. Might be a message. Yes, don't let go. <laughs> don't let go. Don't, don't, sell let out, go don't, don't, let they, don't let go and let a man come in and take over. <laughs> yeah, cool. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Um,